Okay, well, um, yeah, I'm gonna get started. Um, I, I'm gonna mention a video, but we're not gonna, I'm not gonna show it. You know, we're already running back, back behind, but uh, definitely check it out. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna just, this is a, this is called Universal Design for Learning Through a Learning Process, Teaching to the Edges. And uh, really it's, it's, it's about how to aim your lessons how, and a little bit about how, what, who your students are and how you can consider UDL, Universal Design for Learning Through a Learning Process. And it really shares a, shares a part of my journey and a lot of thoughts on the new social sciences program, which is more for the second chat. The first chat is, re chat is really about, about your journey. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm a consultant at LEARN and um, I am a former and a future teacher in English language arts and history. And I'm no expert in UDL. I'm just getting started uh, trying to work my head around it like you guys are. And um, I, I wanna show you some of the places I, I got introduced to it. Um, one is, one is, uh, where's it going? Okay, a little, a little bit about targets for today. We're gonna have hopefully two sessions where we can stop and chat. Uh, in the first section, I'm really talking more about uh, how to think about universal design for learning, uh, who your students are, and, and a first step in a learning process when they first get, get engaged. And, and the second sections are, are more, more about the program. So hopefully those conversations will, will wait more to, the, to there. So, um, Paul, quick, yeah. quick little interruption here. I think we're seeing your screen like in presenter view. So like your yeah, presentation is, okay? is little bit and small. It is. And then we can see your notes too. Well, that's fine. Uh, really? Yeah. Hold on. I'm supposed to share just the window because I, I'll just, I'll do it my normal way then. Hold on. This is a bug I wasn't expecting. Sorry, Emily. There we go. Yes. I, I have, a, I think there, um, so I was a bit confused. I was in the gather town room and I was waiting for the presentation. I ah. think there might, there might still be people there that are unaware that we have to go to the Zoom link, because there's no Zoom link in the Gather Town Room. Oh, uh, there should be. Okay, I'll check that out. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Well, while you're doing that, maybe I'll try to show the video, okay? Has, has anybody seen this video? One person, because it's really good to see again, I've discovered. So I'm gonna share my screen again, try to share the sound. And I want to share this video with you because uh, she shares a, uh, a quite an interesting um, metaphor and it's also very powerful, so. Hi, my name is Shelley Moore and I'm a third year PhD student at the University of British Columbia. In Can you hear it? Vancouver. As Canadians, we have a reputation for finding and embracing the strength in our diversity. This value, however, hasn't been reflected in our classrooms, which still segregates students by ability, especially students with developmental disabilities. There's a gap in our understanding about what we know inclusive education to be philosophically versus what we understand and the importance of understanding inclusion in our practice. This is the question I'm trying to answer in my research, is how can we find the value in the day-to-day -day practice in our classrooms in terms of inclusive education? So how am I going to explain this to you? Now I can sit here and try and describe this, or we can have a little bit more fun. Why don't we go bowling? So let's talk about bowling. You have 10 pins, you have two balls, and you have a lane. The goal is to knock down as many pins as you can. But if you don't get them all, it's okay because you have another chance. But when I bowl and roll the ball down the middle and I don't knock them all down, what often ends up happening to me is that there's two pins left standing on either end and they stare at you. It's the 7-10 split and it's the hardest shot in bowling. How is bowling like teaching? The ball was the lesson, the pins are the kids. We aim for the middle, we do the best we can. The pins that are left standing, we often have another chance to kind of get to them, but at the end of the day, those two pins that are staring looking at you are our kids who need the most support and our kids who need the most challenge. So we end up choosing one and the other one is left standing. I just took all the fun out of bowling. Now, I don't know how many times you've watched professional bowling, but I spent an afternoon watching professional bowling. And let me tell you, there was not one bowler who rolled that ball down the middle of the lane. They throw the ball down the lane at a curve. 
and I was actually really curious about this, so I called up a professional bowler. He was so excited. I don't think he gets a lot of calls about education. He said the reason why the ball has to enter at a curve is because you will knock down more pins and create a bigger domino effect if you enter at that angle. But in order to do that, you have to change your aim. In order to knock down the most pins with one shot, he aims for the pins that are the hardest to hit. Now let's just let this sink in for a second. We are taught to teach the head pins. We are not taught to teach to the kids who are the furthest and the hardest to get to. The kids with autism, the kids with Down syndrome. The part that's critical here, and it really aligns with universal design for learning, is that so often, the supports that we design for those kids on the outside of the lane are actually supports that all of the kids need. This is the part we need to understand if inclusive education is going to move forward in Canada. How can we find this value of diversity in our classrooms between the students? This is not just important for the outside pins, but it's critical for every single one of us. And just think, all we need to do is change our aim. Look how bowling changed education. I can't, I can't watch that without, uh, without getting teary-eyed. But uh, I really loved the metaphor uh, change your aim. In order to knock down the most pins with one shot, the bowler aims for the pins that are the hardest to hit. And um, I want to ask you, when you were thinking about that, did that ring a bell? Um, when you were thinking about it, did you have a metaphor for your own of your own for how to aim when you teach to the edge? And like I said, it was good for me to go back uh, and look at this after the process I, I went through, which I'm going to show you today. Uh, working through a template. And I had a, a few ideas of my own. I'll skip those, but uh, I want you to try to think of if, if you had an idea of how that could fit in, in your classes or um, another metaphor. Um, so question two I want you to think about is who your students are, where they're coming from. Um, she mentions teaching to the edges and she refers to a lot of, you know, um, maybe I don't wanna say uh, disabilities, but maybe uh, differences, differences in ability but also, also differences in uh, skills, experience, knowledge, backgrounds. Uh, that's an important question and that's something you can share with others and how that influences your teaching. Um, just as a side uh, thing I wanted to mention, these images are from a how-to I did called uh, how to teach the intellectual operations. And um, really it was about asking the kids what they really love. And there's a lot of tools that are connected to the intellectual operations, which ask them to just talk about what they love in terms of, uh, you know, where it is on a map, uh, what are the facts about it, where, where, did, where, did, where what's, what, what, what's its timeline, and so on. So you can check that out later. Um, but that's important to think about what, where they're coming from, what they like to begin with. Now, now I want you to think about students when they're learning, throughout the learning process. And uh, this is something I've been thinking about a while. I did a couple workshops on it last year. Uh, because it's not just about the learning process, it's also about the fact that uh, we're in a digital age. So you could be teaching online. Uh, if you're not teaching online, students have access to digital materials. And so that changes a little bit how you teach. And in fact, there's actually a whole uh, website I constructed mostly for workshops, um, which you can take a look at. But really what those are, are examples um, of each stage in the learning stage. And so a generic process, you know, I didn't want to get too detailed with the historical method in that. Uh, you start a class, you engage the students, you explore further, you dig into, dig into knowledge, you investigate with a purpose, you create something to respond, and eventually you communicate it back. Um, so those were specific examples, but what I want to look at is a lesson. I want to look at a lesson from beginning to end and how I tried to try to fit some of the UDL ideas into it before I had seen that video, actually. So keep that in mind. Uh, well, I'll tell you, you what. Click the uh, the slideshow button to make it your slides a teensy bit bigger. Up in the top. That's there. what I did before. You said you saw my notes. No, nope, that's notes? great. Yeah, no, it's good. Perfect. I don't know why you saw my notes before. I must have clicked the whole screen then. Okay, now I know what I'm supposed to say. That's not going to be good. That's going to slow me down. <laughs> Um, anyway, what I want to do is I want to I want to introduce a, a, a process, and I want to do it by 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 showing a couple sections of the new history site, and also there'll be time for you to to jump out and check it out. Um, this is what this house site is structured. Basically, this in by time periods, 
This is mostly the secondary four section uh, equivalent to one of your modules uh, for those time periods. And uh, you see that, uh, while well, the screenshot doesn't hold, show it, but I've started putting up the secondary three document collections as well on this site yesterday. And I'm hoping to get them all up there by the end of the day so they'll be public and easy accessible. So these time periods are there. Uh, each, each, each section has, a, has subsections that deal with uh, knowledge that can be learned in order to describe the period, what's going on in the period, dates, when, where, how, but also chances for students to interpret the period. And uh, so in a later stage of the learning, right? Um, so this is a sample page, okay? This is a, an older, uh, a page that I didn't, didn't tackle with UDL in mind. But just to see the structure, um, we have uh, what they're able to do. These are learning, learning what we call learning intentions. So they're really right out of the program. Uh, we look at the pro uh, program, you'll see it a little later, and we, we come up with these intentions that are sort of ordered and staggered. Um, and then there are also stages. What's less obvious is down the page as it goes, it's quite long. There are what we do to engage the students and, and so on. And what, what, they, what they end up doing at the end is a task. So you can see that this engaged process is like a map. Uh, pique their interest by looking at this really old map. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, you know, you could, go, could spend an hour in this map. And uh, that's how I start the class. So, so at the bottom of the page, there's often a guide, a teaching, a learning guide. If not, it's inside the document collection. And this is an example of a first page, uh, which is sort of a simple one pager that they could actually use. And um, it's, you know, each, each phase states a goal. And, and after, a, you know, and it does, it does state a goal now, but at first I actually had to go back to this and fix it because I realized that I had these phases and I didn't have a goal in mind. And that's gonna, that's really popular or pop popular. That's really important when you're thinking of universal design for learning. It's the goal that is important and how they get there is less important. So that's the overview. But then what happens is if you actually do click it, you get more detailed pages that describe a little bit of the activity. So this is the way I used to write it, write it up. Uh, this is phase one, engage, um, where students start engaging with ideas and uh, they look at this old map and they try to see uh, things that are identifiable. And it has, you know, it has a goal somewhere in there, uh, but there aren't many options or considerations for different types of learners. And, uh, you know, occasionally I would put them in or oh, and or this, but it wasn't obvious and it didn't, the structure didn't lend itself to that. So I wanted to find another way to do these kinds of guides. So um, then after I read a bit more and I realized that there's a, that in the process that considers learning on the edge, we need to think about students, how they're doing it in each stage of the learning, uh, even when they're, you're just recruiting interest. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the actual, I think it's in this slide, in the speaker notes of the slide, there's a link to a, a one hour course that I, that's online that's really good that gets you thinking about UDL. But I'm not going to be showing that. You can follow the link and try it. I'm going to be showing you something else. This. Okay. After I, after I was going through the theory and being really influenced by, by quite, quite interesting presentations, I found this. And this spoke to me. Um, it, my eyes lit up. It's uh, because, because I like, for one, I like lists, but but uh, something looked familiar about this. It looked a bit, it looked like a learning process to me. Um, so what I did was I latched onto this and tried to work with it. And again, I'm not an expert in UDL or anything like that. I'll just say this again about this. I didn't, you know, some of these I've, I've explored it further. Some of them I've explored after I've done this template I'm gonna show you and I realized, oh, I was off a bit, you know, I should change it. But I keep going back to it and, it, and I, I have a template that forces me to do that. So the top section to me, accessing information, reminded me a lot of when you students are first engaging in a lesson and then finding and then further, further on into the lesson. You know, so I wanted to work with this template. I'm just going to focus in a little bit on it. The first part is even in the first page of a lesson, there's the idea of engagement. Within engagement, there's a kind of a, the idea of engagement. Like what is engaging about this? Uh, do they have choice? Do they, is it relevant to them? Uh, and at the same time, is it unthreatening? So these are things to consider right at the beginning. But more than that, right at the beginning of a lesson, you have to consider how you're presenting information. Because, because uh, 
you know, there, there might be, even the display, the physical display of it, or is might not be work in your class. Are there auditory options? Can they hear things? Is the visual information clear? Um, so that's important. And what they're actually doing. What I mean, when I when I used to think about engaging, I th think they'd just be listening, right? <laughs> or they'd be watching. But that's a thing they're doing. And, and forcing myself to think about uh, you know various methods of responsing, navigating through the information, and the tools. Uh, that are available for them. Uh, if they have trouble, uh, you have to think about that right at the beginning and at every stage too. So I wanted to work with this. So I tackled another section. Um, I'm hearing this just a little bit of feedback now. I'm not sure why, because everybody else's mics are closed. Paul, do you still have your gather open? Nope. No. I'm nothing. Okay. Maybe because my, my volume is too high. Is that better? No, I'm still hearing it. Are you still sharing your sound from your computer, maybe? Oh, I could try to jump it out and jump it in again. Okay. I'm pretty, I'm pretty fast at that, actually, these days. I think that'll fix it because I don't hear it anymore. I'm not sure if anybody else was hearing it. You see it? Is that better? Perfect. Yes. It is better. What a messy application. It's never messy when you don't, when you, when you don't need it to be clear. <laughs> when you do. So this is a this is another section. This is the again the top top page, top part of the page. And uh, I put the little teacher's icon to remind you that that stuff for the teachers is always on the bottom. But uh, and it, and it has an, a, a section where the students are first accessing information. I've actually changed this since I read the UBL. Uh, thing and I'll tell you how I changed it in a second. Um, so what I did was I have my guide, my first pager, which which has a little bit about activating prior knowledge, but then they get into sort of okay engaging in the in the in the in the section, and it's an image it's an image analysis again. I often use that, but it's not the only thing to use. And um, so what I needed to flush out do was flush out for each section uh, a little more about. You, that, that's related to the UDL thinking. And, I, and it's in particular the first part about accessing information. So I came up with this and I'm gonna show you how I work with this. Uh, I flushed out a lot of the stuff or minimized it. And I gave myself a template where it reminds me of those sections and it's flexible because not every, uh, you know, not every lesson is the same. I might, I might use more tools, less tools. I might need more description. And it highlights learning goals. So I'm going to go you through this a little bit um, for each section. But first, I want to say that these, these, this, this lesson is not divorced from the program, right? It, it, it's, it's still connected to the program. It still has reasons. Uh, I have targets. So I did leave myself a little place, a little, a little. Uh, hey, Paul, another Paul, another Paul. Yes, I did my, leave myself a place for those connections, and I want to get those out of the way. Uh, you know, which competencies, which uh, IOs, and the fact that it's a, it's a certain phase in a process. So I'm just going to get those out of the way right now. Um, for Irish immigration, you're going to have, no, in, if you're doing the history program, you're going to have knowledge bullets. Um, so this one covers migrations and certain sections of the migration, dark transatlantic immigration. It also covers concepts, which is just below that. And what we did, what remember, we, I mentioned before, we took those out and we transported them into learning intentions. So my intention, my intention for this, this whole lesson, all the phases, is to have the students explain the causes and eventually to be able to map in, and indicate patterns of my immigrant migration. And uh, that's the order I have it. It could be done in the other order too. And keep in mind too that we, our site sections are built around these uh, document collections that we have. And the documents uh, can be used for anything you want to do, use them for. They can, you, can, you can use certain documents that lend themselves to describing um, the period, and others lend themselves to more competency too, which is interpreting a phenomenon and reacting to it and explaining it. So I just wanted to mention one thing. This is a, one I just added recently. When you're, giving, when you're giving documents to work with, with choice is important. 
And uh, thank you, Emily, for pointing this out. Uh, to giving choice is not just at the end of a, when you're doing a project, but also uh, in terms of how they in, engage in, in one. So this is an example I've showed before in other sessions where, um, where uh, people engage, people get to pick which picture they want to engage with. So keep that in mind. Choice is important uh, right from the beginning as well in the, in the, in the, in the task. So I, as I said, I, I, put a, I put something up top for the learning goal. And uh, I had to really think about what my goal was for this stage. Usually you think of a goal as, as the end goal is the, is the competency or the end goal is the content, but every phase has a goal. What was, what was I hoping to achieve here? And so I actually had to think about this and I came up with, uh, basically I just want them a chance to emotionally and intellectually connect to this, this event of the times through the image. And I also wanted them to reflect uh, based on their own experience and prior knowledge. And I verbalized that and put it there. So if, if this learning phase succeeds in that, I'm happy. And then other phases will, be, will go on from there. So I'm going to get into the, the meat of it. That's the final thing. That's what it looks like. I'm going to break it down a little bit. But you can see I, I wrote a lot more than I did before and in different ways, in different pace, places. Um, you know, when, when, when they first engage, I added a story. The story wasn't there before. It's, now it's there. They can listen to this strip. It actually was down below, but I brought it up so that they could listen to it and not just react to an image. Uh, I wanted to, I thought a map would work well there. Um, and uh, and there was an, there's another activity that was there that a friend recommended where, where we, we talked about how, uh, one option would be how the Irish are remembered. So these ors are options and the story is added and thinking about how they would be engaged in the UDL concepts and uh, guidelines, I added those. Um, similar, uh, how I represented it. At first, I just had this image, here's the image, and we're gonna do stuff with it. But then I thought, okay, well, maybe I, maybe I should have something, some maps right away. Maybe I should include some definitions. Uh, maybe I allow the students to share their own experiences and actually map those so they can, they can connect with it. And then uh, there's an image but I had to think about how large the image was. I had to think of how complex it was and how to show it. How, how's it gonna be physically shown? Is it on a projector? Is it, are we gonna be able to zoom in, zoom out? Um, and also, uh, you know, some, maybe some guidelines like the, the World War I uh, thing that I showed had sort of uh, guides to think about texture and uh, the image and foreground and background and so on. So how I represented it had to be thought of and also what they're doing had to be thought of. So this was actually in the, in the activity already. Um, uh, there was an organizer provided. So they didn't just go off and analyze an image as, a, as an introductory activity. I pro provided an organizer for them to organize their thoughts. And so you can see I had, to, I had to write extra and I had to add to the template. So, you know, this is, this is the question three I'd like you to consider is, is have you, how, how do you engage your students? Like think back to a think back to a, a a lesson where it started really well. You you got them thinking. You got them engaged into into it. And what what did you do? And if you if you can't think of one, uh, think of what could you do. And with what, with what, what would you use physically? Um, these are some sample objects of engagement. I'm going to give you a link to this where you can where you can access this as well in a separate slide. But this is actually right from the slide and every one of these is linked to a, a page on the slide. Have you ever used stories yourself? Have you ever used uh, you know, paintings or photos to engage to start a lesson? Did you have some success? Or do you think you could? Um, and what about more complex things? Were these good ways to start lessons where you, where you get them discussing editorial cartoons or infographics or complex things like that? So this is where, um, I want to actually do a breakout room. I want you to get together and you have a couple options. Question three is the big one. How do you engage students? But also, if you had a metaphor for yourself that you thought of, share that, comment, and also just talk, start by talking about your students, who you are, uh, what, who you teach, and uh, get into how, how you could or you have engaged students. And Oops, that's part two. And there's a little link to a sort of a, a separate document 
I don't, I, I'm not going to make this like a task where you have to go and write things down and stuff like that, but I did make a bunch of blank ones if you want. And like I said, these ones, if you're looking for ideas or you want to take the time to explore and see how I use this to engage students at the beginning of activities, uh, you can do that as well. So again, the task is how and with what you engage your students and leave the program discussion for a little later because there'll be time for that. Um, and can we do breakout rooms and I'm going to come around and, and say hi to people and see how they get things going in their classes. So. For sure. How many breakout rooms would you like, Paul, and for how long? How many, how many people? Well, four, four people per breakout room? Uh, so we've got 10 people, including you and I, so maybe two breakout three? rooms? How about three? Three. Three that breakout rooms of two each? Three each. Or two. You can do two. Let's do two breakout. Two or All three. Right. I'm terrible at math. I got this wrong last time I did a workshop and there was like two people in each group. So I used to teach math too, by the way. Okay. And how long? Okay. Let's say, uh, how are we doing? We're doing okay. Maybe eight minutes. How's okay. Perfect. So until like 10, 20. Awesome. So I'm going to open up all the rooms and you should be automatically reassigned. Oh, can I we put this in the chat, the link? Stop enjoying. Okay. Uh, what I do is I do a show and tell, <clears throat> and um, I also have some videos of him um, in England before uh, the invasion of Sicily, of which he was a part of, um, when he's reviewing his troops along with General McLaughlin, who is in charge of the um, Canadian contingency getting ready to go to uh, the continent in England. So that would have been in 1942. A okay. In the contemporary world program too, yeah. Okay, okay. So um, I'm also teaching the history um, this, this year and I'm um, teaching the science and I'm teaching the CST course.
I can't hear you. You're muted. Let me guess. You weren't able to go in? No, I was. Oh, okay, good. Because we had a good discussion. I didn't want to leave. So um, <laughs> I had to be the big bad wolf and bring everyone home. That's fine. But did you actually talk about uh, engaging, uh, how to how to start lessons, engage students and personal stuff? Or did they start talking about the program? Uh, no, oh. they, they were discussing that. I only jumped in briefly to just share the link again. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Because yeah, we had a great discussion. I, I was planning on coming around and seeing you all, but I, I didn't want to leave. We got a, we, I actually, we actually did use the slide and wrote down a great metaphor. You can see what the metaphor was. And uh, it was really about students. And that's really where I wanted to start with this. So how are we doing on time? We don't have much time, right? No. <laughs> okay, well, we won't have time for a discussion for the last one, but I will fly through a few, few other ideas. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, exploring. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, um, we good? Can you see that? Yes, we can. Hey, okay. Okay, so there are other phases in learning, obviously. Um, and what I want to, the second part is really about um, when you're exploring something new and, and uh, you're, you're collecting information, you're doing competency one, basically, um, how you, UDL might fit in that, and a little bit about the intellectual operations as a tool for that. So there's different ways of exploring as, you, as you're get, gathering information. Um, so I put some tools down at the bottom for the Explorer. There you go. And that's really about uh, competency one, which is, which is getting an idea of what happened in the time period in general. This is an example of a tool that, that uses images, but it goes a little deeper. It, it asks them to examine different parts of the image to really sink into the image and, 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 and it gives students choice. So I wanted to show you this. It's in, the, in one of the sections of the site on, on French migrations as an example of both choice and also delving deeper. And in that particular section of it, section which is exploring further, students actually then uh, do work with a video that gives much more details about the context of the situation. So they're able to uh, gather information. But what I liked about this, this teacher is, uh, while well, it's actually a consultant from Soro for Gloria School Board, I like this because the notes they're taking is not really about the program, it's what's important to the students. So um, in this case, they're, they're gathering what's important for them and what the, what's new. So um, exploring is, is about observing, then searching, then finding, and at, that's where the learning happens. But they also have to organize it, and they also have to express it through some kind of description, and that's the competency. So um, this is the competency one from the, from the adult ed program, actually. Um, we call that characterizing uh, a period. Uh, and they have to produce a, a representation of that period. That means they have to be able to say the who, the what, the when, the where, and the how, when. They can do it maybe all at once, or they can do it in parts. Um, and it has to do with chronology, geogra geography, place, and so on. This is what it looks like on an exam. Um, on an exam, um, they have a topic, and the topic's broken down in a couple central elements. Um, in this case, the economy taking off in this period and the politics. And for each of these, they have to talk about some fact. And those facts are all found in documents. And this is the kind of thing I wanna concentrate on in the workshop I'm doing if you're com coming to it in April, um, which is, which is you know, gathering documents to have them work for these, these types of tasks. But that's not how you necessarily do it when you're learning. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. This is another one. Um, uh, also uh, where you're representing a period of time and it's got editable, uh, editable sections. And I put this, the, this down because, uh, you know, some of these have to do with, um, with uh, facts, but also they could be connecting to ideas. And so different intellectual operations come, come about even in this. And that's practicing the intellectual operations is really important. So these, are, these, these can be considered as means for exploring what we call the intellectual operations. There's details about these, but you don't really need, to need, need the details right now. Think in terms of uh, establishing facts, putting things in time, and comparing things. Um, the connection between facts is a little more complex, and I'll show you that in a second. So uh, yeah, we went over, but that's OK. Um, I just want to, this is available in the slide. There's lots of guides for these kinds of things. 
uh, including on the elementary section, um, which gets you familiar with what established facts is and how students could be doing activities with established facts. Um, so again, this is the site. I might try the chat quick briefly. Let's see if people see stuff here. And you know, this is this is a section of the site. It's content, but it's also documents. You can see there's texts. Uh, there's a map. Um, which IOs could be practiced with these resources was the question I wanted to ask. You know, you have some texts about the territory. You have the stakes up, the HDB, an issue there. Um, you have a kind of an interesting map of an overlay, Rupert's land charter overlap with indigenous peoples. Maybe you try the chat if anybody's up for a chat to see, to see any, what intellectual operation could they practice? Could they focus on with that kind of material? See if, I, if anybody's up to, uh, I mean, there's some are really obvious, some are not so obvious. All the ones at the bottom. Ah, yes, but when you, when you evaluate an intellectual operation, you, ask, you focus on one. So, I mean, I guess I'm saying to how, like how, how could you do, how could you, uh, what could you get them doing? Or which one would you focus on most? Maybe the question's a bit vague. Because, uh, because there's lots of possibilities here. Obviously, there's, there's a situation in time, right? Connection between facts is, is, is a good one, but it's more complex one. I was surprised anybody would pick that. Can you explain it? Because, <laughs> uh, yes, definitely. What's the fact that, how, what, how do you connect facts with this one? Um, I think it could be interesting to connect between um, like the, the reasons for why people are um why the the per, like why this land is being settled and the, and the impact that it's having on um the population who was already living there making those kinds of connections it makes me think a little bit of like um the national policy um and like why the west was being settled and and then how that was impacting like uh like the red river for example okay. for sure and that's the most complex one for me, um, the way facts connect in the new program is you've got two facts and they connect to an idea. There's a common idea. So like, uh, you know, going west and taking over the land or something, uh, you know, these two facts are involved in that process. And, or like, is, is a concept involved that connects them or an idea? And you kind of expressed a few ideas in there. So that's more complex, but for sure. Uh, who, who, who are the differences and similarities, Julie? Who would you, what, what's different? How would you use that? Can you speak? Uh, yes, I can. Um, well, first of all, I would make sure that um, that we've done a, a good reading of this particular text and maybe uh, look for specific information, so facts that we would be looking for that are important in Rupert Sand, the South Coast Settlement, and then maybe see how uh, how we can take those, uh, the differences and similarities apart, but after having done a kind of uh, pulling out important words, looking at certain words, maybe making sure that everybody understands what uh, what yeah, each sure. uh, what each is uh, what it entails, and then from there, as everybody has a clear idea or clearer idea of what it is, then maybe look at into. Uh, so I would not go into connections before I go into uh, looking at similarities and differences. But between but before, what two things? But what two things are being compared? Well, uh, you, I would really, you're, you're putting me on the spot right now. I mean, now. there's no right answer. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 I know. But the, nonetheless, I have to, because this, this is quite small for my, uh, for my oh, eyes sorry. now. No, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm going to, so let me just go over uh, the text a little bit more, not take time away from uh, other participants and I'll come back. Yeah. Okay. Well, just, I, I'm asking you to think about it. There's yep. no right answer, but obviously I put a map up here where, uh, where it's an overlay uh, of two things. Dark, dark is Rupert's land, and light is is the is the indigenous peoples. So you know that right there, there's two things that could be dealt with similarities and differences, but there could be other things like you know how how it was pro how how people settled and how they didn't settle. You know, there's no right answers, but 
but but the idea is that from these documents you can you can make tasks where people are specifically pra practicing an intellectual operation and they're aware of the intellectual operation yeah julie you got your idea. yeah i would have i would have gone for the claiming and the, the 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 um the land being theirs from from the beginning so having it the difference between um between the settle the settlers and the ones that were occupying the territory so how when you want to have a territory sometimes you have to claim it other times it's it's yours to begin with your home quote unquote so that's the first thing i would have looked into was how you uh, how you take a territory how you make it yours sometimes you have to claim it in the name of uh, a country or a call uh, a colony and so on and so forth so i would go with claiming versus uh, inhabiting it or having it uh, as part of your uh, your traditions or your, your from generations to generations. Okay, so that would work. And 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 guess what I'm saying is there's no right answer, but it's also to be aware that what you're doing is the students have to, like you said it, you said it. They have to establish facts. You have to gain. You have to have knowledge. And intellectual operations are how you use the knowledge, and getting them very conscious of okay, I'm using this knowledge in order to compare. I'm using this knowledge in order to show that there's a connection, that they're both, that this concept overreaches, and it's still competency one. I'm not necessarily interpreting whether it's bad or good or something like that. This is, they go together, obviously, but it's it's kind of mechanical at this, at this, at this stage. So this is, I wanted to show you this because this one is a, each document represents an actor and one of the ideologies and match them document an ideology. So th the main task for this is really about connecting it between facts. These two believe that uh, Catholicism is great. I can't remember. This is something to do with ultramontism, I think. Um, and uh, you know, you, you need to know what it is. By this point, they know what it is. They've gathered information. And this is these are cards that I made. So you can see, like, documents can be shaped into different ways to make them fun, uh, more accessible, different pre pre presentations, physical. Um, so UDL fits in here. And again, uh, you know, there's no right answers, but this particular one definitely is, is focused on established connections with facts. If the student isn't able to establish the connection between the facts by matching these two, that's the goal is reached, right? Um, so I have different, different goals for each stage. So uh, I think I'm just going to plow through because I only got six minutes. So, but I want you to think about that, um, how to vary the way you practice uh, the IOs. Like when they, when they have to do them, not just like, here's the exam form question, but get them practicing. And also with what kinds of materials they could use them. And if you go back to the slide, you'll see that these are actually examples from the site. Each one is a link to that page. And on that page, that particular type of thing is used more as an exploration, as more, it's, it's not just to open up the class. It's the, the students are doing something with those. Uh, there's photos, those images, this story, they're, uh, they're, they're working through the process and you can get a feeling for, for how to do it. Now, I am going to be putting up eventually on the site sample questions for each of these things, but uh, right now it's really designed for students to read through and uh, do small activities that are practicing the IOs. Now, that just a little last five minutes on choice. Um, a little bit about essential questions what the goal is, the goal is to answer a question, for comp especially for competency two, and a little bit at the end of about choice boards with a lot of cool links. So um, I just wanna mention that, uh, oh, what was I gonna say about this? I don't even remember what I was gonna say about this. This is, this is uh, the, oh, I remember now, yeah. The goal is to map Irish immigration. Um, and um, this is the guiding question. This is the end, the internalized, the process. At the end of the process, that's where you need to respond to a guiding questions, which, which are like, just why do people migrate in general? What forces drive human migration? There's a big guiding question. And there are specific uh, sub questions to that. And, um, you know, so I wrote that down there. The goal is investigate, create something. And it stems from that guiding questions. And the options, what did I say? Options don't, don't, don't equal choices. Like that's a bit different because like uh, option, I give options for teaching. These are several options, but choices is really about the student. 
So giving them a chance to decide for themselves how they're gonna answer that question is another concept I wanted to think, you to think about. So uh, a little bit about essential questions. Um, keep in mind that the, the program is uh, divided up into, into uh, the idea of characterizing, but then interpreting. And um, you know, when you're interpreting, you're not just doing a date, you're thinking about questions. The you're thinking about what's happening, the phenomenon that's happening at the time. Um, the, the program in both programs has a description. And in the description, you can, that's where you're gonna find sort of essential things to think about if you can't think of them yourself. Um, the program bullets, the content is, is sort of dry, but in there, you're gonna find the key questions to think about. Um, and that's, we call those essential questions. This is from a very old presentation, but I thought I'd bring it back. Um, they're linked to the content goals, but they also serve to, to, to link prior knowledge and new knowledge. We talked a lot about that in our group. Um, their basis for understanding uh, so key ideas in the discipline. So um, think about them, some are open-ended, some are closed, some are, are overarching, some are typical. So closed, you, you know, you expect an answer um, and uh, it could be topical. Topical might be related to the union the unit, but some are more overarching, like, like why do people migrate? That can be used over several units. And so that might be a, a goal, an essential question that is maybe not in the activity, but it, it's something you think about and at the end you come, come up to a conclusion with. So here's some examples. Uh, why do people move? How does settlement geography affect settlement and so on? So there's a little bit about essential questions there. Uh, what happens when culture collides? I was doing that yesterday with document collections and I noticed it, stem, it overlaps three or four. So you see these sub questions at the top Oh, sorry, these at the top of the, the page, you see these essential questions and also sometimes sub questions. So the essential is did lives get better or worse? But the sub question is specifically how did economic growth accelerate the growth of Canada? So sometimes the questions that they're asking at the beginning of a unit to get people thinking uh, as an ultimate goal is both essential and a sub question. Um, this is what it looks like on the exam. It's really about it. It's really a, a an essay question you're working towards. So um, getting them to work with these ideas, big ideas, the consequences, and breaking it down into, into sections is something uh, we're going to work on in the other workshop. Um, I'm going to just skip ahead, I think, because I've got to finish at 45, right? Um, this is just an example from a, from a guide where they, where they work on, uh, on uh, interpreting, and um, they're working towards a uh, you know, working with different different intellectual operations, in this case, continuity and change. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna just skip ahead. Options, this, is, this was the last one you saw before. These are, these are options, but they're not necessarily choices for students. And what I did was I started working on another one where I, where I, where I, where I for myself, I wanted to have a choice. So this is an example of a choice board. And down below, there's a bunch of links in this one to different choice boards, and they're really fun to start take a looking, taking a look at them. But basically, you know, if my goal is to explain the impacts of industrialization and to respond to questions like these, it's not as important how much I reached that goal. So I made this one where the students would get to pick one. They get to pick an area, and they get to pick a, an activity, and there's a space here if they have another suggestion for another type of activity that they can do. And in order to pick, they actually have to sort of drag one of these over saying, well, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna talk about facts or I'm gonna talk about timeline, but that was just more sort of to get them thinking about uh, their project. But that check out the links down below. There's all kinds of neat ones um, that, that show you examples for when their students, the goal is to answer the question, I can give them lots of options that they can work with. And there's even one that's really fly where, the, where, the, where the, the points have to add up and you can do all kinds of different points and students can mix and, mix and match so that they get 50 points. It's, it's who, who thought of that? So um, yeah, so I'm going to end there. Uh, again, this is here. I do have, uh, I'm, I'm going to work on a video on this and maybe post it, uh, post it uh, online to sort of go to the last part. But I think, I think people get it and uh, that uh, you have to think about UDL on each stage of the process and go back to those guidelines. And you can look at the bottom of the Irish immigration section for see how to see how each of the other phases 
I, I work through the EDL process and, uh, and I'm going to do it again, but it'll probably be very different <laughs> next time I do it. So thanks a lot. I'll take some questions now. Uh, I can show different slides and things if people want, and I'm done. <laughs> What's happening? Emily? And how about you go first? Cause I'll wrap us up. Oh, thanks. It wasn't so much a question, uh, more of a comment. I'm listening to Paul speak and I'm getting really excited because I love creating interactive, engaging activities for students. Um, and I, I did actually want, I was wondering how many teachers have tried using something like Lumio to engage their students. Has anybody? Isn't that the video thing where you speak and? No, Lumio is part of smart uh, technology. And if you haven't had an opportunity to check it out, I really, really encourage you to do so. It basically combines the smart board, um, PowerPoint presentation, uh, Kahoot games. It has um, graphic organizers and it's all included in one presentation. And you can actually share the code with your students and they can work along so you can take an activity and create a handout that will uh, that each student will work on individually or it can be interactive where they're at kind of like a shout out type of activity so when you were showing your cards the cards where they had to match the individual with the uh, ideology i i got super excited because i'm thinking this could really work well in something like lumio where you create your cards and the students on their devices can actually match the people up with their ideologies. So I'm just, I just wanted to put that out there. If you haven't checked out Lumio, I, I think it's something really interesting that teachers can get a lot out of. And what's nice about it is that if you have PowerPoint uh, presentations, you can import them and everything gets transferred into the Lumio and everything is saved online. You share the code with your students and it's it's uh, there's a lot of potential there. So, and also if anyone wants to work on anything like that, please let me know. Cause I get super excited and I love doing this kind of stuff. So that's all I have to say. Is Emily gonna kick us out now or are we gonna? Yeah, so I'll wrap us up. Um, so yeah, if Tanya, to your point, if, um, if your school already subscribes to like the smart board services, you will have access to that, super cool. My particular dossier with Deresi involves the creation of digital resources for learning. Um, so because we have this new curriculum and we finally have the DEDs, we finally got some exams, we know that this program is finally coming to adult ed. Um, I am super down if anybody else is interested to get a, pro a, you know, a project going next year. Maybe we can rope Paul in um, along with Julie to create some digital resources for history for working with the primary documents. Um, Paul, thanks so much for your like, the opportunity to think like, how are we bringing in opportunities for engagement, representation, action and expression through history? Um, Cause I think that's what's gonna be like a bit of a shift with this curriculum is that it's gotta be more hands-on for students. Students do really need to get you know, diving in with these intellectual operations. And so my question for you is that template that you made for building a lesson with the, like looking at the different phases having, um, and then the three parts of UDL, you have like the slide template. Is there an editable version of that but, template yeah, anywhere that people could use? Everything's editable. If you go down to the, the bottom of the Irish immigration, you can always grab it. And I think, if I remember correctly, um, there's a blank slide on that one. If there's not, I'll put one in right now, uh, okay. where it's just a blank. Where And the other thing about that template that's not obvious is I put stuff off to the side. So if you yeah. zoom out, I actually put the whole UDL thing there. And it's got the links, too, even, even if it doesn't look like on some yeah. of the slides. So, uh, so okay. um, you know, like... Yeah, because I'm on... Yeah, um, you, you can copy it. Slide 28. And it's, uh, it's like, is it an image or something? Like I can't go and type in it if I wanted to copy it. Oh, uh, there's a link above what you clicked on. So here it is. Okay. Uh, I'll try to share, share it. Oh, my mouse, my, my keyboard just died or something. I can't. Well, it could be something we could put in the, um, 
above the above the guide, there's a little thing. Click here to view the Google Doc. I can see nobody's in there, and there's a blank slide in there. Oh, somebody just popped in. Um, but it's not the presentation version where you click to see the presentation version. It says, it says click to get the Google Google slide. Okay, perfect. Oh. I'll have to try and explore and find that. Awesome. Oh, so I was trying to. I, I see what I was doing. Hold on, I'll send it. There it is. Um, I was trying to send a message to Julie for some reason. She was gone. Um, yeah, in slide seven of that one, there's a empty template and then the thing again. And even off to the side of the empty template, there's also the thing off to the side as well. And there's a couple of things in there. So yeah, you can just copy that. But you can also okay. see like how I went through it, what I changed. That's a live document. You should be able to copy it for yourself. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. So um, we have eight minutes until your next block if you're signed up for block hey guys, two. It's my style, man. <laughs> All the Zoom links that you want can be found on the page of our ACE website. Paul, thank you so much for chatting with us. It's so fun to nerd about, about history because we never get a chance to do it because we're often the only person teaching history in our centers. Uh, contact me anytime, people, if you want to chat or go over some stuff. No problem. Do a Zoom in a second. My car. I never get out. <laughs> He's not joking, also. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I sign off, I leave, or do we stay around, Emily? Or uh, No, I'm good. I will make sure that this is in the digital tote so you will all have access to this presentation. You'll all be able to, to get these resources just in case you haven't saved them. Don't worry, we'll take care of that for you. And thanks so much for being here. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Paul. Hey, thanks, everyone. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye.